Yeah, no, we uh, we had like a whole week of about 75 degrees. Mm. You know, it hit nearly 80 on Easter weekend, and then it's just slowly but surely been pushing us into hell ever since then. Mm -hmm. It's been snowing mm. for three days straight. Yeah. I've been sleeping with a heating oh. pad the last two nights, <laughs> which is a very girly thing to say, I will. I'll fully admit <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of emasculating for me to say this on air, but <laughs> is that for the cramps? There, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there really isn't a, a masculine way to just say that word in general, is there? Heating, heating pad. pad. Yeah. <laughs> Something uh, about pad. Well, maybe it's not a good word. Like hyphen for men at yeah, the end of it. There we right? go. Like a little bit there of a you, sub, you know, and it's heating pad for men. Yeah. Stream heating pad. And it's like patterned like uh when a regular <laughs> pad is not enough, apparently. <laughs> Unroll your tactical heating pad today. <laughs> it's and survive the rugged outdoors. <laughs> it's textures I've, uh, like nylon. I have I have a question about this actually, because I know that you know, you live in Texas, which has right. a traditionally pretty strong you know, masculine reputation. Mm. What, what do you think of this rise in masculine influencing? You know, like I feel like all the time I get stuff, advertisements that are like bespoke thing. And it's like knife, leather, whiskey. You know what I mean? Like what, what, do, what do you think mm. of that whole weird cultural brand thing that we're doing right now? Well, you know, it kind of annoys me. Mm. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Because there's a sense in which when I think of like, my great granddad, you know, this is like a real man's man. I mean, you go back one more generation and we're talking about a moonshiner mm. in South Texas with a 10 gauge shotgun, you know, who was friends with, yeah. yeah. I mean, he literally was friends with the judge. So he got the moonshine during, <laughs> during prohibition. Beautiful. And that's, that's manly. They didn't really have to go, you know, all you had to do back then is just say it's genuine, yeah. you know, genuine <laughs> leather. Genuine bricks, and that's all you needed. Yeah. So that, that yeah. already identified it as a manly product, right? You didn't need right. All these accoutrements. The, the the use was manly, not the uh, sort of inauthentic brand uh, label. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, and back then though, those materials like leather or et cetera, that was practical. It was cheap. It was you know, it was it was dependable. You know, now it's you know, there's better, more dependable things that you can make a thing out of, and people are like, no, actually, it's about. It's about the look. It's about the feel more than anything right. else. I don't know. As I, mean, I sorry, go for it. As I say here with my <laughs> with my leather iPhone yeah, case. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we're not sponsored by iPhone. You can't be. Yeah. You can't be naming those. Oh, kind of I'm brands. sorry. Yeah, it's not, it's not. What what brand integration do you guys need? Uh, what do we need? Uh, or you know, like like I can I can work in any oh, product. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Liquid yeah. Death Manscaped. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, we don't. Unfortunately, need, not. No, no. Or fortunately, yeah, we're we're not tied to corporate overlords, dude. There are no mm. puppeteers. You know, if anybody does want to give us a hundred thousand dollars and dictate our content, then I'm all I'm all sounds for it. Sounds good. <laughs> Throw it our way. <laughs> yeah, we'll take You're it. You're primed and ready to sell out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, man, somebody. so so what's so what's new? I heard that you're uh, working on a blog. Is this true? Yeah. Well, see, I, I like to say it's a journal, okay, not a blog, because in my mind, a blog has sort of three defining qualities. Right. Mm -hmm. The first is that the the main content is going to be at the front. And the rest is just an indefinite list, yeah. right? You're, you're not meant to look up old blog posts. No, no. Okay. The second thing is that you built it on a template. So you went on some site and it just had your little blog template and you did that. Uh, and the third is that you post a lot, mm -hmm. you know, frequently. So my website, I didn't build it on a template. I built it in Webflow, you know. Yeah, nice. I, I pretended like I was a web developer. <laughs> I, I don't actually yeah. Know, <laughs> Uh, um, you put one if then statement into a box, and you're like, "All oh, right." right. <laughs> well, I, I mean, if I'm yeah. if I'm being honest, I'm ChatGPT did the whole <laughs> yeah. thing. But um, beautiful. Uh, but uh, you know, so so I built it myself. Dad Gummit, going back to manliness. Yeah. I, uh, I I I never post to it. Mm. I mean, infrequent. There you go. And and my and my my first post is at the bottom. Mm, so you have to scroll all the way to the bottom of the page in order to see it. Well, there, there's not enough there to have to scroll, yeah. but it's at the bottom. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, let's see, instead of, you know, like walking into a field and just picking rocks off the top of the mountain, you have to really dig deep to find your content, right? Where the true <laughs> gems lay, right? Underneath it, all of that sediment. 
you, you have to dig so deep that it's not on social media. And I only tell people by word of mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and if you type in the, the name in Google, it's not going to come up. Yeah. You're going to have to put in .org at the There's end. There's no it. SEO. There's no SEO involved. Are you, are you even willing to divulge the name of this website on this show? I, I will I will divulge it. Okay. Because this is word of mouth. Yeah. And, you know, I consider any direct message I give somebody is word of mouth in this age. So uh, yeah, true. it's called delectus.org. 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 And that's and then you host that yourself. You're not on. I do. It's not doc, dot wix. You know, we're not talking about Blogspot. I was surprised yeah. you didn't go with Substack because that's what everybody nowadays is doing. But I'm special. I, apparently, yeah, yeah. apparently, too special for Substack. It was, makes it a little yeah. harder to monetize. Is that is that a thing that you're ever ever intending on doing? Or the, the you know, obviously, there's the temptation mm. to put a little Patreon tag on there, mm. right? <laughs> But uh, the the longer I go with it, the more I kind of like the idea that I'm just shelling out cold hard cash every month to support a website that no one reads. Yeah. I just kind of like that idea. That's just the uh, amount of pedits that you are going through in order to make truly beautiful content. It's like, right. uh, are you familiar with the concept of outsider art? Are you familiar no, with this? I'm not. So it's it's a there's a whole tradition of it. It's not just people who are like say countercultural or et cetera or outsiders culturally, but people who literally are outside of everything like somebody who's in the woods or somebody who is in their basement or in their attic at all times and just produces an entire collection of work and then right. they find it later right there's this uh, turns out uh, i'm intimately familiar with yeah. outsider art <laughs> exactly that's what you're doing right now the, the, the most famous example is this guy who had visions and he constructed an entire religious system right with like an altar various statuary vestments out of trash you know you had uh tin foil light bulbs coke cans that sort of thing he wrote a scripture right. not like a an entire scriptural text that's hundreds of pages long that nobody has been able to translate because it's its own developed language all these things and it was just in a storage unit in the middle of washington wow. dc so you know, hey, goals. That's yeah. <laughs> retirement plan right there. Exactly. That's uh, how things are starting to starting to you know look around here. Yeah, things are starting to pile up on the old desk. Yeah, they're gonna find your blog one day and be like, truly, uh, a, a man of an enigma. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Influenced that's by right. the outside world. Right? Yes. Yeah, I'm just going for the Hulu documentary, really. <laughs> <laughs> the one where who killed Joshua Hamilton? Is that what you're looking yeah. for? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, hey. Except we'll know who killed Joshua Hamilton. It's going to be <laughs> some disgruntled woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, guys, speaking of the name Joshua Hamilton, right? we've got Joshua Hamilton on the podcast right now. Welcome. Welcome to the, Welcome to the show. Welcome to Monomania. Good, good to be here. We're happy to have you on. Uh, what? How would you actually, Dylan wanted to introduce you as... I, I was going to say writer. writer, director, right? These are <laughs> things that you have done. But would you would you attach those labels to you at the mo, right? At the at the at our here and now, or would you r like to still be pictured within that lens? Uh, I think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's it's a fair use of language, right? I mean, I do write, I do direct in my head. Mm. You know, I've, <laughs> I make. There's a lot of there's a lot of movies up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've, I've started dabbling in a little, uh, little composition, things like that nice. as well. So, you know, I think that's, I think that's a fine, fine label. I, I can live with writer. Mm. There you go. So you would say writer is sort of where your, your primary focus is at the moment. Y you know, it, it's interesting because when I started off, uh, I was kind of a film purist, you know, I was kind of one of these guys like, well, you know, films only about a hundred years old, a little over a hundred years old. And I'm going to be one of these guys to sort of go out and really define what cinema is. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to find out, we're going to separate it from the stage. Yeah. You know, this is not going to just be Shakespeare on the screen. As I've aged, I've realized that it's precisely Shakespeare on the screen. <laughs> and that this idea that there's some sort of like pure medium is, is uh, totally ludicrous. And that really uh, film is a literary endeavor mm. at the end of the day. Mm. Interesting. Okay. So, Let's let's dive into that a little bit. I think, yeah, that sounds that's really interesting to me. Because, you know, as a theater guy, as a guy that did perform on the stage, you know, one of the things that I would, and this comes from a lack of knowledge, right? So, you know, feel free to shoot me down on this. I would look at, say, at the stage has you know the suspension of disbelief attached to it. It's got uh, different tools that are used to communicate things like set dressing, uh, location, mood. 
um, that, you know, tools that are different in the film medium, right? Um, so where do you think that line is blurred, right? Where, why are those walls a lot less sturdy than a lot of people like to think they are in your mind? Well, for one, there's just sort of, if we take a step back and look at it pragmatically, mm -hmm. American theater is dead. <laughs> True. Yes. I mean, you know, yeah. like I don't, I, I don't like saying that. I love Tennessee Williams. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the only people who go to theater live in Washington D.C. Yeah. Or New York or L.A. Mm -hmm. There's nobody living around me going to the theater. Yeah. And yeah. if they are, they're going to reruns of shows that are in the canon, right? They're not going yes. to see new plays or yeah. performed by 16 year olds at the high school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or gimmicks of some sort. Yeah, you know, yeah. like watching Shakespeare, but done with uh, people that don't have left legs. I, guess. <laughs> I, don't, know, what I, mean, talking about. I don't know. I mean, we got to get we're trying to get as specific as possible. Yeah, although they're doing that at the Globe Theater now, so yeah, it's kind of getting a little out of control. But so yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, so 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 from that perspective, um, there's a sense in which if we're gonna do plays at all, if actors are gonna have a place to act, mm -hmm. it's gonna have to be on the screen. Mm -hmm. That's just sort of a practical yeah. thing. To a certain level, that just has to happen. But sort of taking that a step further, you know, what I realized when I was, because I wrote the screenplay I'm trying to make right now. Mm -hmm. I wrote it as a screenplay and then I rewrote it as a novel and then I cut that novel down and then I cut it down again back to a screenplay. screenplay. Mm -hmm. And in that process, I sort of realized that uh, all a screenplay is, is essentially a play that has learned prose from the novel. Mm. Because with a camera, now I can do prose. Now yeah. I can spend 15 minutes showing rusted out cars yeah. and you know scalloped horizons and whatever I want to do. I can I can do Cormac McCarthy all day long. Yes, you know? yes. The tendrils in the night yeah. <laughs> folding in space. A very, uh, a very Malick-esque kind of vision in my mind. Uh, just like, we're just gonna look at the Austrian mountains for 20 minutes and you're like okay right all right you're communicating something to me in a way that you know Cormac McCarthy would or you know somebody who has a richer more romantic tradition writing style for 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 imagery mm -hmm. you know and yet I'll go for it. or go ahead I was gonna say and yet you know you still have that very sort of I don't want to say procrustean but it's that Grecian like here are your acts and your images yeah. and we can draw attention to something really subtle just by the fact that we've done a whole scene around it Right. You know, in a novel, if I want to be subtle, I have to go, I kind of have to jump through hoops with prose, right? Yeah. To be subtle, I have to be really, really not subtle in a sense. <laughs> yeah. I have to write like giant paragraphs about the one little thing. In a screenplay, it's a lot easier. I can just devote a scene to somebody arranging flowers. And now you have to ask yourself, well, why did he devote an entire scene just to that arranging flowers? It's just a bit more like a nice layer of images, just like yeah. a regular play, but we bring that. Mm -hmm pros in and 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 so, so i don't know in my mind the difference is technological not so much essential mm. so do you think that's where and you're, you're talking about acting now having to kind of be in film right is that where the actors really bring something to the table right because when you're talking about something like the arranging flower scene in mm. a novel depending on how straightforward the author wants to make it and if we're talking about this in the in the real tradition of the novel they'd be making it very straightforward <laughs> uh but what that person is thinking in that moment or what is identifiable in that moment what needs the attention that needs to be brought to the specific way the stems are stems are arranged or etc like you need to take some time if you're devoting a scene equivalent in a novel it's something that is going to be kind of explicit in its nature but the performance of the actor or actress in this situation, isn't that translating that same information? Isn't that, you know, what, what the person is thinking or feeling has to be done entirely off of the visual language. And so only somebody who has the ability to access that emotion on camera, somebody who's going to be able to do that for you? Well, absolutely. And this is also sort of where it ties back to this, like where the screenplay is actually sort of part of an older tradition than the novel in a sense. Okay, yeah. I mean, you know, the novel is this, somewhat 19th century thing yeah that's 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 you know obviously a little too broad <laughs> mm -hmm. but like in the 19th century robert e lee is telling his sons don't read too many books yeah mm -hmm. and he doesn't mean because i want you to be you know knowledge is dumb he means stop watching so much tv yes yeah that's what he means mm -hmm. and so 
you know, not only are you sort of relying on the actor to bring that psychological realism, but there's also a sense in which you're sort of going back to what, you know, Dante is doing, what, what these older poets are doing, where if I want to be existential, I don't have a narrator's voice going into all the existential problems in my, you know, internalization yeah. of this arranging flowers. I have to create, construct a set of mediating images, a sort of mm -hmm. objective correlative, as um, T.S. Eliot says, that's going to give you this ontological, existential, whatever you want to call it, meaning mm -hmm. uh, uh, without, without this sort of like almost sometimes <laughs> perverse uh, <laughs> internal outlook you know what i mean yeah, like, yeah. like it's, the it's average person on the street right just the way that yes. it's you know constant like internal focus and emphasis on the person as opposed to and you know in their perspective as opposed to the truth itself right right and and you know and and obviously you can you can do subjectivity you can do very very personal films mm -hmm. it's just sort of a question of um am i really am i really saying you know here's something that i can i can plant this image in the mind of just an ordinary person yeah and they're going to be benefited by that as a you know opposed to this sort of uh you know i mean i love catcher in the rye great novel but at the end of the day how many kids really appreciated the catcher in the rye yeah you know yeah that, that's funny Too many, because, unfortunately yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well one guy shouldn't have appreciated it yeah, i guess. appreciated it a little too much actually i don't know i mean john lennon dying Good or bad? I don't think we've actually really kind of come to a conclusion oh, on that. Oh, no, one. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jury's out I have on to that. to go into Yoko here. Yeah. Uh, so I want to push back a little bit on something. Yeah, um, sure. Which is sort of the the role of the actor uh, in the... So you sort of mentioned yeah, yeah. like the emphasis of its importance within the film as opposed to the play, Yeah. right? Um, I would kind of push back. I meant... I meant as opposed to novels. Oh, as opposed to novels. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Right, that makes <laughs> sense. But I, I also want to sort of emphasize something, which is in a screenplay, right, there are very often, and it's, you know, people write these very differently, very clear directions on emotion and uh, sort of thought process that is running through a character's mind at the moment um, that mm -hmm. is being filmed, right? Uh, the individual cries, Right. Say like that. That's just written in the script. X character cries um, in in plays. Often those kind of directions are not implicit. Right. Um, or explicit. Ex sorry. Explicit. Uh, except for maybe in uh, Bernard Shaw's writings. Generally, it's a um, here are what your character says. The actual acts and the uh the way that your person reacts to those lines or yeah. how you deliver them is entirely up to the director and the actor working together to put something forward. We're often, again, with a screenplay, it's much more explicit. Um, so I'd say th there's a little bit more of that improvisation, right? And sort of that, that rawness yeah, that's that falls to apart it. in the actual direction process. Well, I wouldn't... That's why the people who win Best Original Screenplay rarely win Best Picture. <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> well, well I, I, just, I disagree with that, though, because I think a good director in a play scenario, mm -hmm. right, is providing a... What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, is, is allowing the actor to do that kind of a thing. And I don't necessarily know if that's the norm or if that puts together a good film. I'm actually right. curious to know what Josh has to yeah. think about well, yeah, this. That's but. why I'm going to throw this <laughs> over to him. Well, you know, it's interesting because this is one thing that I would like to liberate the screenplay from mm. yeah. is the sort of, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, Treating treating the, the screenplay as a piece of equipment mm. that we sort of take out there and we're going, you know, this is our battle plan for the film and we're yeah. going to kind of hit all these beats and all that stuff. Obviously, I don't think you're a very good director if what you're doing is just going out there and kind of winging it because there's a sense in which you're wasting a lot of people's time and a lot of people's money yes. <laughs> and potentially mistreating people because of the fact that they have to stay late every night. Yeah. Um, but that being said, uh, really, a I think a good director of a film should absolutely be making a sort of space for the actor to work. And um, now I, you know, I won't say that like there is a sense in which the American theater maybe got caught up in a little bit too much post Freudian mm. malaise. You know, maybe there's just a bit too. I mean, it's funny. I love Stanislavski's book, mm -hmm. but I read. I don't remember the name of the book. It's somewhere on my shelf. It's it's <laughs> the it's the guy who I think he did the actor's studio or something in oh, New York. I can't. Shoot, I forget his name. 
I know who you're talking I, about though. Yeah. Yeah. And I read it and I, and I, and I, I got towards the end and I just stopped reading because I went, this is entire, completely uninterpretable outside of Stanislavski. Yeah. Like this man has said nothing the whole book about the method of acting. He's just talked about his experiences as an actor. <laughs> and so there's the sense in which the actor, you do need to make the space for the actor to really find the character and really bring everything they, you know, internally to it. And if they feel like they need to cry in that moment and it's not written in the script, then let them cry, <laughs> right? Let's do that. Uh, but at the same time, um, Mm. I, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it, it, it just requires prudence, right? Mm -hmm. There's a sort of middle way between that. But the worst thing in the world is, is a screenplay that reads like a technical manual mm -hmm. and hears all the beats and all that stuff. If a screenplay isn't readable in a classroom to be studied by children like Shakespeare is, it's useless in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, so how does that apply though to camera direction, you know? That's a, just a totally different process. Yeah. So yeah. When, when, for me, at least, when I write a when I write a script, it's all um, the sort of given circumstances, right? Yeah. It's just everything physically happening, um, and then I'm gonna make I make a shot list. Um, right now, I think I have a shot list with like I don't know, well over 400. I mean, yeah. it's a, t tons of shots, tons of storyboards, and it follows the you know i have it linked up with the script but it's amazing how much different it is than the script <laughs> so there's this aspect of like cinematic interpretation that's the yeah. necessities of the medium mm. so uh, how long's the how long's the film at 400 shots on the shot list would you say it's a 88 page script okay so i think it's you know it could be anywhere around 100, 130 minutes something like that yeah because what isn't it somewhere around like a minute and a half to two minutes a page yeah, they, they, there's like this old rule about a page a minute. Yeah. But uh, sometimes I fill up a page with prose. Yeah. And so I don't know if that applies anymore. You're like cornfield. You're like, well, yeah. how long are we supposed to be sitting on cornfield for? Right, right. You know, yeah. that, that's like one cut, you yeah, know. Yeah. So. so I actually have a, a quick question about, you, you know, you talking about this in comparison to say something like the novel or whatnot. What, what do you think about art, visual, written as a didactic thing? Right. Mm. Because some of the greatest novelists in the tradition of the novel in the 19th century way that we would describe it. Right. You know, the you know, Don Quixote being the first. Right. Um, but like Tolstoy is a great example of this or the serialized authors like um, uh, Dickens or Dumas or et cetera or Hugo. They're very explicit, first off, about what you should be deriving from their work. But also, they'll spend chapters and chapters and chapters just explaining a thing to you. You know, Tolstoy's mm. famous for this, especially in War and Peace, not so much in um, Anna Karenina, but he'll be like, the philosophy of history is a nuanced topic, and then go yes. for, you know, 100 pages and you're sitting there thinking, well, what happened to the, the, the yeah. characters in this in This, this story? isn't a novel anymore, yeah, you exactly. know, I'm reading an essay. Yeah, um, but, you know... A lot of people, when they talk about the novel and some of its great practitioners, you know, um, they they talk about the lessons that you're learning from the work, right? Mm. And that there should be some sort of explicit knowledge that you're being granted by something from like the Bronte sisters or um, you know something like Pride and Prejudice. You're supposed to be like, oh yes, uh, there's there's much to be learned from this work, uh, right? And they're very explicit about what the what you should be learning, right? And they're delightful books, but at the same time, you're sitting there thinking, well, I. You know, when you read something like at the more modern interpretation, and by modern I mean contemporary, like from something like Cormac McCarthy, it's like, well, I don't have mm. no idea what the hell he's trying to teach me here, yeah. right? This is something that right. you have to mine through, you have to work through. Do you think that film ever went through a similar trajectory, right? Because film kind of came of its own in a very different world. <laughs> you know, the, the 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 birth of you know what we kind of see is the contemporary stuff, like the French New Wave and all that. Right. Mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of pushing the boundaries early on. Do you think there's yeah. a didactic period? Do you think that there's a, a tradition of that? Because a lot of what I see, especially with art that's labeled as conservative, in, the, in nowadays especially, is very didactic. It's mm. very explicit about what it's trying to tell you. And it's tiresome because of it. Yes. Uh, and there's... I don't know. It seems so out of touch with what film specifically is in my mind. So I'm just curious if you think that that like that didacticism is something that 
is a part of film, if there's something equivalent to say something like a Tolstoy in it, and if there's any value to that, because in my mind, I'm having kind of a hard time seeing it. So I think this is a characteristically 20th century, 21st century problem. Yeah. Right. And right now we're still simmering in the broth of the 20th century, as far as our ideas are concerned. Um, so we're all sort of the t children of Nietzsche, right? <laughs> there's this, there's this sense in which Nietzsche goes, okay, God's dead. Religion is, is, is useless. And so what we have to do is instead replace it, replace it with this sort of uh, atheistic art, right? Art will become the new thing for religion. We will, the great men will, will create these works that express what their greatness is, ex exert their strength, and we'll sort of admire their greatness in yeah. these works. And those will be our new and gods. And then he just sat around just running behind Wagner for like 20 years and being like, I right, really right, want to marry saying, your wife so bad. <laughs> right. And then, and, then, and then at the end saying, I can't believe you made Parsifal. Yeah. yeah. You know, what have you done? You went back to this, this, this older tradition. Yeah. And so really what, we, what, what, what you kind of have is you have this interesting, this interesting dilemma where we, on the one hand, we have this, the Nietzschean sort of art as the new religion. And on the other hand, we have the sort of Kierkegaard, you know, pure religion. And this idea that like it, whatever we do poetically is going, is, is going to be existential. It's going to sort of tap into this, um, oh, it's, it's really going to be rather sort of mystic. It's going to be sort of a Meister Eckhart, this sort of idea of like, I'm not doing theology here. I'm not doing scholastic logic. I'm doing, uh, uh, I'm giving you metaphors. I'm giving you images that express things that are, that are totally inexpressible. Yeah. And we're sort of caught between these two halves. So, but which one has been winning? Obviously Nietzsche has been winning, right? <laughs> yeah. Nietzsche has been horrendously winning. Uh, but unfortunately so have, it's not, it's not good art. That is the God. <laughs> it's in fact, uh, Marvel films. <laughs> right. Right. And, and, and yeah. see, and this, this is where, where you get into the real, the real grotesqueries of it. Right. Because so what are like the, the, the pillars of, of Nietzsche and art? Okay. That's like Stanley Kubrick. Mm -hmm. 2001, a space odyssey is not there to teach you a lesson. It's a pillar to the sort of greatness of Stanley Kubrick's imagination yeah. <laughs> and, and, and to man, you know, Stanley yeah. Kubrick is the great man making Nietzsche and art. The other example is James Joyce. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> James Joyce. And, it, and it's really, and this is where it's really helpful to compare Joyce and Faulkner, right? Cause Faulkner is a meta is, is a guy with a metaphysics. Faulkner believes in a telos for, for humanity. Faulkner believes that man is immortal and that like he has to deal with God. And Faulkner is much more on this Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard side, of the, side of the table. But he writes just like James Joyce, right? He has all this sort of uh, flowing prose. So comparing them is, is quite useful. Yeah. But with Joyce, what do you have? You have Finnegan's Wake. Yeah. <laughs> you can't read the first sentence, mm -hmm. right? He, he, he finally, you know, this is the will to power par excellence. <laughs> He's going to say that like, I am going to be the baddest writer, whoever was, I'm going to win writing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to win novel novels. Whereas Faulkner is more like, what does he say? He says that uh, victory is an illusion of, uh, of, uh, of philosophers. What is he? I can't remember. Fool, philosophers and fools. Mm -hmm. So Faulkner doesn't even believe in victory. Joyce is out here winning the novel. <laughs> Faulkner is saying there's no such thing as victory. I, you know, I grew up in the South. We got defeated. It was horrible. And we thought we were great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'll do. Yeah. Though I will say uh, uh, the book that does the best at representing this of Joyce's is Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man. If you have the opportunity to read that, I highly recommend it. That's like the one Joyce I haven't, I haven't touched. You got I, just, it. You I got read it. Ulysses it's, and I went, okay, I'm done. It's a pseudo by <laughs> biography right so it's, it's you know it's a fictionalized biography and i i hated it the first time but loved it the second you, got, you know it's a good novel when <laughs> so mm. so what do you think about so what would you just translating that directly to film then so you're saying that kubrick's 2001 is sort of him saying i'm winning the movie is yeah that, is that your I, i'm winning movies day? i'm winning yeah. and that's what he's doing he's winning sci-fi He's winning horror. He's attempting to win war movies and he doesn't do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, he tries to, but he, he doesn't do it. He's winning like, like the sort of, you know, film noir kind of thing. He's winning comedies. I mean, you know, that's what he's doing in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, but of course the question is, is like, well, what's the alternative? Yeah. Is the alternative God's not dead? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're going to make God's not dead. <laughs> Sorry, God, that the two. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah exactly. Uh, yeah, so that 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 that's funny to think. So, what, what would you see as the like the Faulkner equivalent then? Would that be a, would that be a Malik? Right? Would that be a willingness to sort of 
stew in something. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Well, the 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 it is it is mysticism. Yeah. The 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 response to Nietzsche is mysticism. You have to be someone who goes. You know what? I believe. I'm gonna I'm gonna quote Meister Eckhart again. I don't even know <laughs> if I'm saying his name right. But he has this quote where he says, uh, he says, "I've never heard God speak to me, but I've heard him clear his throat." Mm-hmm. Okay, it's that idea that uh, I'm going to sort of look beyond the veil of the positivistic scientific world. And I'm going to see the truth. I'm going to see God. And in doing so, I can't tell, I can't use language to describe that, you know, like, 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 like Wittgenstein's going to tell me that like, there's really no amount of like detail I can zoom in on this thing that has no detail to zoom in on. Mm. I, you know, so I can't really use language very well. So what am I going to do instead is I'm going to use metaphors. I'm going to give you images that give you intimations of this, uh, of this, uh, you know, metaphysical truth, this, you know, maybe deeper ontolo- ontology. So that's like Malik. That's yeah. like um, Tarkovsky. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're saying that you're, you know, uh, you want somebody walking out of a theater and they, they, they're walking into the theater and they're like, I think something has come to me in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> that's precisely it. Yeah. And this is where Cormac McCarthy is an interesting figure. Yeah. Because yeah. he lives at this Santa Fe Institute of Physics or whatever, and he's sort of <laughs> surrounded by positivism. Yeah. And yet I can't help but, I mean, and, and Cormac can't help. Yeah. But sort of fill his writing with this. There's there's a mystic element to his writing. Oh, for sure. There's yeah. there's this numinous in his writing of like God lingering over all this. There's something beyond beyond the, you know, sort of apparent uh, qualia of our daily lives yeah. lingering over. Yeah, it. but in, in his mind, I feel like in from what I've read of his, it seems like that thing is is dark and terrible in a certain respect. Mm-hmm. Not like in a not like a void or et cetera. Right. But there's yeah. like his a, his evil supernatural. Well it's almost like it's 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 Gnostic in a way. There's like a demiurge yeah, that yeah. exists. You know, that there there's this evil thing that's sort of pushing us towards evil but there's like a certain sense of redemption in his work but it, it's definitely there's a darker underbelly to it all oh for sure yeah the, you know I, I think i think sort of for me the key distinction is just the fact that like ultimately uh he he has a metaphysics yeah like you know he's not quite a monist he's not this like anglican humian <laughs> tradition yeah you yeah know? so actually speaking about cormac mccarthy it's funny that you're talking about this more nebulous pre- presentation of images I almost feel like his desire or his lack of um, quotation marks is almost just a, a straightforward representation of that. Cause I'm mm. actually, it's funny. I'm reading blood Meridian right now, which I have not, I've oh. not read blood Meridian. I'm reading it. Uh, I've done, I've read other Cormac McCarthy, but I've not read blood Meridian, the, the opus or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's confusing. It's weird. It, it puts you in a situation where you're not really getting straight answers and you're just sort of having to pull from something. The words in any scene could be coming from multiple sources unless he's explicit about it. It's almost like I, I wouldn't recommend somebody listen to any of his work on audiobook for that reason, right? Because you're getting explicit speakers. Oh, but it's so good. It it's is so, so good, good on good. audiobook. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, was, I listened to The Road a few years ago on audiobook and I... You know, I know it's not necessarily one of his more beloved works, but it was really funny to me because it was on Oprah's reading list, mm-hmm. and she he was like on Oprah. He got interviewed by Oprah <laughs> right over the, yeah. over the over the road, and it starts off with this. For those of you who haven't read it, it starts off with this image of a eyeless salamander esque creature in a grotto under the earth, stirring. And its size is immeasurable, and it's just wading its way through the darkness and the moist. And you're sitting there like, I just can't imagine <laughs> just a whole crop of wine moms, you know, <laughs> the Joy Behars of the world, sitting there with a glass of white wine, cracking over the road because Oprah told him to, and be like, what the hell is going on? Oh, beautiful. Yeah. No, the, 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 it's it's sort of it is. Uh, he's had sort of a charmed career in yeah. that sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, I suppose <laughs> you could say that my career has been very similar because really the only people who have read my work are, you know, older moms, yeah. you know, who my mom has sent it to. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, you know, that, that is a sort of, it's, it's, uh, it's bizarre. I, I, I think, yeah. I think it goes, just goes to show that most people probably, you know, you just sort of get past that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you just sort of. 
You're looking for Move those uh, narrative beats. Yeah. Right? Those are the things that well, people so are the thing into. Well, so that's the thing is, like, going through the road is a good example where you could tell the points where people were talking about the book, the shocking elements, you know, mm. like the, oh my gosh, the cannibalism, the et cetera. And you're getting there, you're like, I mean, honestly, this isn't what sticks out to me <laughs> about the book, you know? It's the an, best part of the book, if I may say so, yeah. is, okay, you have the whole book, right? Here's the whole book. Yeah. And then here's the ending. Mm hmm. And that jump from the book to the ending is the best part. And I'm not talking about when, you know, you know, spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't read The Road. Um, you know, when 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 the sun kind of goes off with the other people. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about when he says, you know, once you could, you know, go fishing in the mountains and there were brook trout in the streams and they smelled like moss and they had patterns on their back that were mazes. And then it's just like end of book. Yeah. <laughs> and those aren't complete sentences either when he says it. You know, like yeah. if you go in there and look at it, they have periods, but they're definitely not <laughs> a complete thought. Uh, and and that to me, that's that's that like that's that metaphor thing. Where yeah. It's like, well, what does this have to do with anything? Mm -hmm. But that has haunted me and it has absolutely informed my thinking ever since just just that juxtaposition you know i, I fly fish so i know exactly what he's talking about yeah they do smell like moss mm. interesting stuff that is funny when, when you're talking about him being at the santa fe institute it's he when you read interviews with him about you know science he's like i love it. <laughs> he's in love with yeah. science it's a it's an interesting well he has a lot of thing. celestial imagery so it does make sense yeah, yeah. but still but still. I, I think it's i think it's a sort of hobby yeah. And, it, and, you know, probably there's a sense in which sometimes uh, surrounding yourself with the stuff that you don't do. But, you know, what? I'm going to I'm going to go in a different direction here. <laughs> the people who are sometimes most interesting to talk to about um, literature or work like that are people who are not academics in that field. Yeah. I mean, honestly, and this is not true of everybody. Obviously, Hillsdale has some fantastic professors who are wonderful to talk to. But if you talk to your sort of average PhD student, English PhD student about literature, it is unbearable. <laughs> it's dreary. Yeah. They have no insights. All they do is think, wow, this is really good. And they've written a whole essay, you know, you know, dissertation or whatever they've done. They've done yeah, this whole yeah, paper, yeah. their doctoral thesis on just, wow, this is really good. <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're not really dealing. They've, they've been around the subject matter so long, they've, they've lost their ability to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So well. speaking of, though, I think this is a great segue, actually. Uh, you know, people who are not experts, people who are not educated on a particular <laughs> topic. This show is ostensibly about something, right? Ostensibly. Ostensibly. The show is Monomaniacs. Uh, basically, what we attempt to do on the show is bring somebody on the show who, uh, to talk about the thing that they're into right now, right? The thing mm. that they're sort of is occupying their mind space. It's not something that they have to be an expert about. It's something that they just got to be into and passionate about, right? That's what we want to hear about. So, Josh... I gotta ask you this question, right? What right now would you say is your mon monomaniacal obsession, right? your white whale? Well, I mean, my my, I I I think my white whale is the same white whale that uh, I, I'm sure you had Chandler Wright on the show at one point. <laughs> we have had and him I, on the show. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think we share a similar white whale, and and and. But mine's is this question that keeps me up at night, mm -hmm. which is. Why am I trying to make feature films? Yeah. And we already answered that question in one way in this podcast, yeah. which yeah. was the first meaning, which is like, well, why feature films? Like, what do I think? What, what is a feature film? What do I think it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently I think it's just a play that we put on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I hate to, hate to, hate to ruin the mystique for everybody, but yeah. honestly, I, I feel like I learned cinema in like a week. And after that, it's just been dosey -si dose, you know. <laughs> Lee Bowser hires me; I make money with it, and and so does Chandler. You know, I swim in their wake, and that's how I get by. <laughs> you know, they're the uh, sharks out there. They have families. They're like real men. You yeah. know, like 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 Lee Bowser and Chandler come home, and they have like these, you know glassy-eyed children looking up at them, calling them dad. They're living like real men. And when I come home, you know, I've got Seinfeld on the TV. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've, 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 you I've got a car. You have a luck in common in that instance. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. But I think there's, there's the, the other question is like, well, it's answering the thing we went into earlier, but I don't think we really answered precisely is like why uh, – why, why am I, why put myself through this? Mm -hmm, you know, yeah. what's the use 
of making art in general. Because I'm, I'm not going to make any assumptions here, but based off of what you've been talking about, you're definitely not looking at it from like a Nietzschean perspective, right? You're not trying to impose no. your personal will uh, in the creation of art. Uh, so you are, would you say the inverse or is it more nuanced to you? Is it somewhere in between? You know, it, it's interesting because some days I think it's in between. Mm -hmm. Some days I think Nietzsche said, well, philosophy's dead. And so now, you know, we're all sort of poets or mystics. Yeah. Um, but in some ways I, I do sort of wonder if whether or not what I'm really trying to do is find this middle way where it's like, well, maybe we can be philosophers again a little bit, but there's this struggle that's happened where philosophy has sort of slid into the realm of the social sciences and or psychology, mm -hmm. which is, again, not surprising considering that Nietzsche called himself a psychologist, mm -hmm. right? Like who's out there doing public philosophy today? It's like Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Jordan uh, Peterson's out there talking about chaos. <laughs> and when he talks about <laughs> chaos, you know, that's philosophy. That's not psychology. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, maybe but, Zizek, I don't know. <laughs> no challenge. I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can't do him at all. Right? Yeah, he's got to rub your nose over and over again. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, talk about fulfilling your super egos. Yeah, with, yeah, uh, yeah. Toys. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, no, yeah. There's so. I think there there is a sense in which. Um, you know, it's kind of the question of like, why did, why did I create this website yeah. where I'm like writing? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, it's hard to give the, the precise answer except to, to say that uh, I do believe that like the deepest truths of the world have to be mediated in images and can't be given to us with, uh, with just ordinary language, which yeah. I would include mathematics in. Mm -hmm. You know, I think mathematics is just a very particular and specific language game that... Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. We, we have this viewpoint right now that everything is like validated by statistics, right? Yeah. You know, if you want to make any point today, even philosophical, and Jordan Peterson is a great example of this, uh, you, can't, you can't simply go out there and do like platonic, rational discourse, right? You have to say like, well, you know, I, I dove into the literature. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look at the literature, you know, you have to like get into the literature and yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. how like we have all this inductive um, you know, statistical reasons for believing a certain thing is true. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there, there may, I, I don't, I don't think that, 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 that can ever get at the, the most essential truths. In other words, I think that in a sense, all you're doing there is sort of gaining greater and greater resolution, grading more and more specific language to talk about a certain type of thing, mm -hmm. to talk about this, um, what maybe what we might call the physical world, although I don't really know if physical world is a good word or not, mm. but you, you know what I'm talking oh, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so maybe we're just zooming in more and more and getting a greater and greater texture on rocks instead of really, you know, understanding, well, what's beneath the rocks yeah. here. I, I actually to kind of to bring it a little bit more explicitly into filmmaking. You mentioned that it creates unique problems because it's, by its nature, very collaborative, right? Right. And especially with, you know, people having specialties within the industry, within the, within the process, it's not just one person, one camera, and one piece of editing software. It's a crew of people, actors, mm -hmm. directors, grips, techs, et right. cetera. Is that part of, in your mind, one of the reasons why it's kind of an inter insurmountable goal? It's like not as, as a democratized of an art form because that is the reason yeah I, I i literally have a ship fully built sitting in dry dock waiting <laughs> to go i just need somebody to give me seven hundred fifty thousand dollars yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that's and all that's it a, takes that's a conservative estimate you know what i mean it's it's, right. it's, it's that's that's you know. no wait no no that's a budgeted estimate yeah. that is like <laughs> i'm talking about i have gone through the script and broken that thing down to each yeah. and every you know tissue I need for that movie. So then, what's point. the what's the next step then in that regard? I mean, like to to a young enterprising male in, in possession of a screenplay, you know, right, how, does, right. how does one how does one make that movie? Where where do you have to go from here? Because you have a vision, you have your everything's constructed. There's no, I mean, a producer could only really get you so far when you have everything's laid out the way that you do. You know, what mm -hmm. what do you what do you do? It's fundraising. Yes. I mean, yeah. so this this is the sort of 
this is this is the, the 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 greatest hindrance in filmmaking and why honestly it's sometimes a shame that the american that like theater can't work on a more mass media level yeah and also maybe you know at the end of the day why the hope is is that you know eventually the technology is going to get to the point where we don't really have to necessarily go out and shoot people with cameras although <laughs> i think that would rob us of acting so maybe we shouldn't do that yeah, maybe that's yeah. a bad idea but um but this is it, it 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 there's this problem where like filmmaking is business at the end of the day mm -hmm. and and you know it, you have to treat it just like a business you know you have to ha sort of have your prospectus and you have to go to people with the money and try to convince them that hey i think you should give me money for this film for whatever your equity stake is in the overall budget of the film and just so you know, this is kind of like speculating in oil, except for way worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the idea that this well is going to hit is terrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, and I, and I, that's what producers do sometimes. I think what's super interesting about what you just said is how, if you're comparing it to a novel, right? With a novel, the scale is limitless to the writer, right? As long mm. as the writer can, you know, communicate and has an understanding of the scale that they're working within then they can write it down on pieces of paper for free, right? Right. But, you know, if if you wanted to make an entry-level film, you know, say it's like my first film, it can't be no, anything. No, 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 no. You go, you buy a used camcorder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it can't cut be up a bunch of cardboard. <laughs> anything above a entry-level situation. You know, yeah. you can't have a true limitless creativity with no, no budget, Right. Whereas with a novel, you, you can. And so I imagine when you have large scale, interesting ideas. Right. And you have a really clear sort of vision. It's really I, I imagine it feels uh, very sad, limiting in the fact that you like you have this thing that you want to create, but you don't have the means to do so. You know, oh, uh, I, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you here, but a, a no, good go indication ahead. of this would be. Um, and the film Ar Argo is a good uh, is a good uh, reflection of this. <laughs> The amount of screenplays that were bought by studios after Star Wars came out, that were sci-fi screenplays, right, that just languished in studios. You know, screenplays that could potentially have been really great works that just languished in studios for decades and still are languishing in studios mm -hmm. because it's, like, literally impossible. You know, you say, like, well, right? you know, we don't have the money nor imagination nor capabilities to make a sci-fi epic a reality, mm -hmm. right? Just even going right. outside of that, I mean, it's why... Most directors get their start start making horror films. <laughs> you know, it's cheap. You got one and location. There's also, you know, I've talked to a producer. You know, I, I'm basically talking, trying to talk to different people I know and producers yeah. all the time. Right now, I'm talking to the best, the best. I, I'm talking to a guy right now who I know has made films just like mine in before. Yeah. Whether or not it'll go through is way up in the air, but at least there's that. Yeah. Yeah. But. I've talked to producers who, you know, they really, they'll be like educated people. You know, they'll, they'll have read a lot of good books and, uh, you know, be fairly worldly. But when you look at their IMDb page, it's like, you know, Christmas Zombies 5 and <laughs> all this stuff. And they'll tell you, well, this is where the money's at. Yeah, like they, yeah. There's like these little, you know, sort of um, slush markets where you can sort of throw these into or whatever, you know, like. Yeah. But th th there's a lot of, there's a couple different movie holding companies that basically uh fill up amazon netflix you know with all their yeah. like filler stuff shovelware yeah yes exactly and so making a real work of art making you know sort of in, in my estimation trying to make american literature uh for the screen is just tremendously difficult and in my case it has driven me to to ridiculous lengths i mean <laughs> you you may notice this piano here next to me yeah yeah I taught myself music theory and I've learned how to, how to do all sorts of software synth stuff in Ableton simply because I'm like, I need to make this as easy as possible for any producer. Like I'm going to score the darn thing, you know, just, just let me make it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, whatever it takes. Uh, yeah. 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 That's, I mean, there is a certain, there is a certain beauty to that. I uh, especially since you that means you don't have to license anything in that in that situation unless of course you've got a real you know banger of a needle drop somewhere in that screen. No, no, no. <laughs> can't afford that. Just like 
<laughs> bad to the bone begins playing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh man. No, so yeah. so so do you want to talk a little bit about the movie at all? Is that something that you feel comfortable having a conversation about? I mean, you know, I I I I don't know if there's much to talk about, you yeah. know. It's uh it's it's just I'm going to be shooting it in Texas when I shoot it. Yeah. Um, so many movies today that are in Texas are shot in New Mexico mm. because of the uh, tax credits, but I'm not going to do that. It's just wrong. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's just wrong to write <laughs> it about these people and to know it so well and, uh, and set it, set it in New Mexico. Was Heller High Water shot in New Mexico? Oh yeah. Oh, that ain't gosh. post Texas. I've been to post Texas <laughs> many a time <laughs> and that ain't post Texas. That's, that's New Mexico. Wow. Tragic. Jeez. Yeah, there. I think there was a, maybe a few scenes they shot in a few places in in Texas, but the majority of it was shot in yeah. New Mexico. Yeah, which someone like Nolan, brilliant idea, Oppenheimer. Yeah, okay, it all happened in New Mexico. <laughs> so there you can you just go. shoot the whole movie in New Mexico, and it's exactly the right place. Albuquerque fiction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, but yeah, so you know that's sort of that, and. Um, Mm, I don't want to, you know, give away too much right yeah, now. Yeah, that's fine. I think it's all good. But uh, it's it. I'll, I'll just say this: it's uh, it's uh, you know, it's 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 an actor's drama. Mm. It's it is like I said, it's been through a load of development. It's really not. Yeah. It's just a totally. I sort of rebuilt it from the ground up, and it's just something. It's you know. I, I can't even quite explain it anymore. It started off as one thing and it became something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I, I, you know, I feel like we got to clear the the air on something real quick. Uh, like, oh, okay. Uh, because Dylan and I and a couple of other guys, actually, Patreon supporter Carter Woodfin was a part of this process. True. Um, true. We read a very early screenplay version of this story, right? In like a yes. table read format. Josh was not there. Mm. We uh, we went. Up, we went like an hour and a half up north and back to get our hairs cut, That's, and then which was total waste of time. Yeah, total waste of time. Uh, but whatever. we did not the, not the reading, but the, the, reading, the fact that we the, drove an hour and a half. We drove an hour and a half to get a haircut. Yeah. Um, and I think at that point we called you and we had like a brief conversation about it. Yeah. And I heard from somebody like that. that you were very upset by things that that Dylan and I said. And I was curious if this is true. And if so, I I, I want to apologize. I, I don't, really I don't know if work. it was you guys. I think it, I just got the impression <laughs> that I was like, what I really needed to hear at that moment was yeah. what uh, was was what uh, you know what's his name. Uh, uh, uh. Quentin Tarantino always says, I, I don't want I don't want to hear your critiques. I just want to hear it was badass. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just want to hear it was great. Yeah. yeah. So, you yeah. know, that was that was th th there's definitely some truth to that. And you know, that's that's the the tender heart. But hey, at the end of the day, I did rewrite it as a novel yeah. and like go through years and years of developing it. So it's probably fair. Yeah. But you know, whenever you're first starting out and you just dropped out of college, you're a little sensitive. You know I mean? <laughs> you're kind of going, I don't know yeah. what I'm living at home. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> this better be perfect first try. Yeah. I feel yeah. like uh, yeah. we have a bad predisposition to the over critique and I'm sure it's valuable to some people, you know, who really want to hear it bad but you know we'll we'll read i'll I'll read something and i'll come up with i'll come up with what ostensibly is bs <laughs> to, as long as there's some sort of critique involved so i'm sorry that you had to be on the receiving end of that yes true. Hey, uh, when you was, know what we were younger and less experienced men much as you were when you, younger. when you wrote it <laughs> hey that's you know i appreciate it and at the end of the day you know you got to get used to that. Yeah, I mean, true. you yeah. know, it, no. it beats you down one way or the other, right? People are like, if you can make a, a, a brilliant film that's, that's, that is incredibly successful and, and the critics can still pan it, you know? Mm. So you have to, you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah, that's, that's true. Hey, uh, we actually will have to, speaking of, uh, we talked about this a bit earlier, the, the, the temptation to put a Patreon button on your website. We want to thank our patrons <laughs> uh, as we roll into the, the final uh, yeah. act of this episode. Um, we could not do this all without you. Uh, I want to thank especially our top patrons, Samuel Roberts, Joe Papalardo, and Zach and Amber Streely. Thank you so much for your support. Um, uh, you can go to our website and look at all of the benefits there. Uh, one of the benefits, though, is our post show, our Patreon post show, which we record after 
uh, every episode. Um, that's five dollars to see. So if you're interested in that, you can go to our Patreon and listen there. Uh, things get a little bit, a little bit crazy, a little bit. It's a little uncensored over there. Not that <laughs> we haven't said anything here that needed yeah. censorship or whatever. But anything way at the ten dollar tier, you can ask questions and we will answer them on the uh, episode. And uh, we got some questions for you specifically. Uh, All right. Uh, Patreon <laughs> member Joe Papalardo had a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, they had quite a few. Uh, we don't have a ton of times. So we'll, we'll try to move through these relatively quickly. I mean, yeah. we're not going to go through all 25 of these or whatever. Um, sure. So <laughs> you really had a lot of questions for you. Yes. Okay. How about first and foremost, uh, what has Josh learned from his periods of solitude in the last few years? Oh, well, by periods of solitude, he means period of salt now <laughs> uh, uh, so it's in whenever i was in college i saw this video by andre tarkovsky where he said young people needed to learn to be alone with themselves he said they're always out there going to concerts and all this stuff sort of because it's you know to go back to kierkegaard it's just like this boredom you know you're just sort of running from boredom to boredom to boredom and Tarkovsky said, you know, in his Russian, you know, that uh, that uh, uh, young, you know, young people needed to learn mm-hmm. to if they didn't learn that, if they, if they couldn't be alone with themselves, then that means they were bored with themselves. Mm-hmm. And that was like, that's probably a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if anything, that's that's what I've learned is just like, look, I, I've learned how to not be bored with myself. And it, you know, sometimes I'm sitting in this room, pacing around naked, you know, ranting <laughs> and railing in God. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, Maybe yeah, I've yeah. been drinking. I don't know. <laughs> no, what but, day uh, is it? I, uh... Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. What time is it? Two. Um, uh... But uh, but uh, you know, so it's not all easy living alone. But there is a sense in which you can let it all hang out. If I had if I had kids and a wife, I probably shouldn't be pacing through the living room naked, ranting and railing. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But when you're alone, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. The benefits, right? The benefits. Right. Uh, all right. Let's move on to a next question here. Uh, this one uh, I think is for the table for the for the room. Uh, best Scorsese films or a very specific question. <laughs> uh, all I have to say is it's definitely not Gangs of New York. <laughs> That's my answer. Uh, Josh, I, how about I you? Am- I am torn between two, and that's Raging Bull or Taxi Driver. Mm, classics. And yes, the old, I, old Scorsese. I want to say, see, there, there is just a almost perfection to Rage, Raging Bull that's mm-hmm. just hard to beat. I mean, yeah. there's just something really, really special about Raging Bull. But uh, then at the same time, Taxi Driver is just raw and right there on the edge <laughs> and happening in color. Mm-hmm. So... I, I can't choose it's between true. those two. It's true. I, I do appreciate the choice, though, of, of Raging Bull being in black and white. Uh, it, it, it creates a very interesting set of emotions. Um, mm. IMO. But in your opinion. In my opinion. Uh, you uh, you have I don't really opinions? have I don't really have a, 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 a I haven't seen enough of the movies. Yeah, I mean I'm I'm in the same boat. Yeah, 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 I would say as as long as it's not Gangs of New York, uh, <laughs> that I am a okay. That was a <laughs> speaking of isolation. That was me alone uh, during summer school. Uh, just in in my dormitory, watching it on a laptop and being like, I, I think I watched it when I, in summer school alone as well. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And I, I got to say, it was one of the <laughs> a, a, a rough three hours. It was yeah, a rough three hours. <laughs> uh, I, I know that kind of sounds like uh, my favorite Scorsese film is the still from uh, Killing of the, of the Flower Mood or whatever <laughs> the new one is the the new one that he's directing with. Uh, you know, DiCaprio. Oh, oh, the something moon. Yeah. 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 Where they've just every, they have only released one still from the movie. So it's constantly in the news. And it's just like, you know, Scorsese says this about the movie or the movie's two and a half hours long or et cetera. It's just one still over and over and over again. It's pure cinema. Pure cinema. Pure cinema. <laughs> yeah. Geez. Not a Marvel film. Yeah. Definitely not a Marvel film. Okay. Uh, worst video game? Question mark. This is an <laughs> interesting question. I don't know if. Do you have an opinion in regards <laughs> to this? Worst Josh? video game. League of Legends. League of, oh, that's a good. It's a good answer. That is a good Easily. answer. Easily. Yeah. Just, just destroys people's lives. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. I, I would say, yeah, anything with a, uh, anything with a freemium, kind of payment structure that's sort of bent on convincing people and especially children to dedicate their lives to something that's just uh 
Mm. Yeah, totally useless. Something like Fortnite and or Valorant, you yeah, say. Yeah, Fortnite, Valorant, even something like Candy Crush, you know? Mm. A waste of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I work in video games for a living, and uh, sometimes... We are sent games <laughs> that we have to play in order to see whether or He's not. a producer. He's on the other side of the pipeline. It's true. <laughs> uh, to whether or not we publish this game. Uh, and I can't, of course, name any names. <laughs> I got to say, the worst games I've ever played are within that pipeline. Because usually I have like a distinct choice as a consumer about whether or not I like actively participate in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if the if you would t- if you were to nail this down specifically into worst game I've ever played, it's within that space, yeah, uh, very easily. So I can imagine yeah. some guy dropped out of college for that. I know it's <laughs> and here's yeah. Speaking of from the other angle, uh, there are few things sadder in my mind than getting the email back from somebody that says, "Hey, do you, what are your? Uh, I know you didn't want to publish this game." Uh, could you provide us some thoughts and criticism? Mm. That's really hard <laughs> for me because if I look at a thing and I feel like I I actually don't know if there is anything here that is to me a redeeming yeah from either even from just like my own personal enjoyment of a game or like view of it as a piece of art like quote unquote right I I don't you know I don't think there's anything here this <laughs> this feels really really bad <laughs> I and I I don't want to say anything right like I cuz this poor person obviously is very passionate, passionate enough to be reaching out to people to give feedback on and potentially even pay for them to make this game yeah another piece of collaborative media exactly yeah. and and you know I have to I have to, and that, like, whatever, this is me, like, complaining about being the guy that has to say <laughs> no or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, it, 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 it pains me to say that we laid off half our workforce. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I can't <laughs> believe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I, it's it's tough because, again, it's it's somebody's really, something something, somebody, something somebody is very dedicated to, has put a lot of heart into and emotion yeah. into, yeah. Josh, and Josh, it doesn't uh, quite cross the wh- line. What if you did send your screenplay to a a, a producer of some sort and they said gonna pass right not right. my not my cuppa the classic editor at a magazine response that's not a what what if statement <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so i'm saying you know that happens and what if you were to say well can you please provide me some feedback and they were like mm. look i'm going to be straight up with you it sucks i hate it yeah you know what what, what like what, what goes through your mind in that kind of situation or what, how are you like is that something that you say okay i'll accept your thought your opinion on that compartmentalize it so it's not something that influences anything that I do or is it mm-hmm. something you take and you kind of bring to the work well I would never ask that question yeah. but if I did <laughs> if I did I would say accountants and business majors don't know what they're talking about yeah. so I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing yeah, yeah. I, I no. actually had spent I, I uh, went bar crawling in New York City with a, with a movie producer once he was friends with um, a friend of mine and he was accountant business major type you know what I mean it was all mm-hmm. dollars and cents. It was dollars and cents. He was he was promoting like a an environmental message movie of some sort. And yep. he was like, What people want? They want a message. They want to leave the theater knowing they've made a difference. All this stuff. Yep. And I'm like, Yep. Okay. <laughs> that's a bummer. That's not very I know who that's... knows if the movie's any good, but it's like that's uh nothing, nothing there. <laughs> hey, when you when you when you strip out the religion and you leave the art. Yeah. Sometimes the art isn't enough, and then that's when the Frankfurt School has to come in. That's when a little bit of Marxism <laughs> has to come in and fill in the blanks of the religion part. Yeah, yeah. And that's where you get the message. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, all right, we, we're actually out of time, we're folks. Out of time. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you're interested, uh, hop on over to our Patreon. Just search Monomaniacs Pod to listen to the after show, or just listen to any of our other episodes. Thank you so much for coming on, Josh. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Is there anything that you need that you want to plug? Anything you want to send people to? Yeah. Remind us what the name of that website was. It's delectus.org. Delectus.org. It's delectable. That's my review. Mm-hmm. Delectable. Exactly. I haven't even seen it. I could tell you straight up. I've seen it. We had uh, Luke Robson on the show, and he, and he had it open on his phone. <laughs> oh, really? <Yeah. laughs> you got, Beautiful. You got somebody out there giving that word of mouth. Yeah, right now. exactly. Yeah, exactly. And he mentioned though, that you're, you're, you were thinking about including other people in the project, like making it collaborative, or is that not the case? I, I've played with the idea. Yeah. I've sort of, it, it's one of those things that's sort of out there, you know, maybe I could do, you know, but I, I'm not sure about it at the moment. At the moment, 
I'm sort of focused on my own manure business, mm. right? <laughs> like people have hearts and if the good seed's going to grow, it's got to grow in good soil and somebody's got to make some good shit okay. to mm. keep that soil, you know, make it, make it fertile. So yeah, that's it's nice and nutritious. <laughs> yeah. That's where I am right now. <laughs> okay. I'm just a manure man. Yeah. Just a manure man. All right. All right. Well, thanks again for listening to everybody. Thanks, Josh, for hopping on the show. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. All right. Bye.